<clears throat> All right, we're in the uh, book of Psalms, and we're in Psalm number five, and we pick up our study in verse nine today, and I believe we will go through Psalm seven, we'll see how that goes. Anyway, let's pray one more time. And Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. We left off in verse 8. I want to begin reading in verse 7. Just keep in mind that this psalm was written by David. And like many of the Psalms, it is a prayer. So he says in verse 7, But as for me, I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy. In fear of you, I will worship towards your holy temple. Just a reminder that David says that he would come into the house of God in the multitude of God's mercy, meaning he realized that he didn't deserve it. You know, he didn't earn the right to come into God's presence. Nobody has earned that. But God in his mercy allows Christians, those who have been forgiven through Christ, to come into his presence in prayer right now and into his house, which is heaven, after they die. Verse 8, lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness because of my enemies. Make your way straight before my face. In other words, he's, he's saying, God, show me what to do. Show me how to live. And do it because of my enemies, you know. He doesn't want his enemies to be able to accuse him of doing something wrong, of doing something ungodly. They're going to accuse him anyway, falsely, as we're going to see. But he doesn't want there to be any substance behind their accusation. So he says, God, keep me on the straight path. Don't let me do anything wrong. So, well, let's, let's look at verse 9. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction. Their throat is an open tomb. They flatter with their tongue. Stop there for a second. This is exactly what I was talking about. This is talking about words that people speak that are unkind, that are untrue. Referring to David, David is referring to his enemies and slander and gossip. And we've all probably lived long enough to know that people's words can be as deadly as any bullet. You get a slick-talking, gossiping slanderer, they can do a lot of damage to an innocent person. And there really is no way to completely counter vicious words once they're spoken because some people are going to believe that they're true, whether they're true or not. And I've always taken comfort when I've been gossiped about or whatever. I've always taken comfort knowing that I know that it's not true. And God knows that it's not true. And people who love me and care about me know that it's not true too. And I'm okay with that. And other people, well, they're going to believe what they're going to believe anyway. So it doesn't matter. But... Uh, you know, the question might be asked, what do you do when you're slandered? If it doesn't pay to counter it or try to counter it, you can try to defend yourself, but it usually doesn't work. So the best thing to do to at least avoid the frustration that comes with being gossiped about or slandered is to pray to God, is to ask God to use that slander and that gossip to bring about something good because he's able to do that. Verse 10. But David goes, he goes on, he says, Pronounce them guilty, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against you. That's another thing you can do when you've been slandered. You can trust in the fact that God is going to pronounce those people guilty and that they will pay for their sin against you. They're not getting away with anything because they haven't just sinned against you. They've sinned against God. Primarily, they've sinned against God because God hates the sin of slander. 
It's a sin. And gossip, that's a sin. And God hates those things. So verse 11. But let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. So the best thing to do when uh, someone sins against you is to take refuge in God. And that's what he's doing right here. Take refuge in God. In other words, trust in the fact that God will use whatever has happened to you for your long-term good and that he's going to take care of business if that person doesn't repent of the bad that they have done by receiving Jesus Christ and the mercy that comes through him. But if we respond to being mistreated that way, if we respond to evil that way, then at least you can't, you can't do anything about the things that were said about you that are not true or the things that have been done to you. There's nothing you can do. I mean, it's done, it's done. God will take care of them. They're, they're not going to get away with it unless they receive his mercy, okay? And then they're still going to suffer in some way for it, at least in this life. So there's nothing you can do about that. But if we respond to evil by taking refuge in God, trusting that he's going to use it for good, trusting that he knows what's what, if we respond that way, at least we're not going to lose our joy. At least we're not going to lose our peace. That's how we take refuge of God in a situation like that. So, I can confidently say slander is not going to ruin my life. Okay? Because if it would, it would have already. Slander is not going to ruin my life. Gossips are not going to ruin my life. False accusations are not going to ruin my life. What people say or think about me falsely, that's not going to ruin my life either. I'm going to be happy and content just knowing that God loves me and the things that they say are not true, and he knows it. And that's all I care about. He knows it. If I'm right with God through Jesus Christ and I'm pleasing him and I'm confessing when I fail, then he's going to take care of anyone who falsely says bad things about me behind my back or slanders me. They're not my problem and they're not my worry. And I'm not going to spend one single second fretting about anything that somebody like that might say because they're not worth it. Why? Why would I waste my life when I know God's going to take care of business? And he's going to use whatever bad was done to me to bring about good. I'm not going to sweat it. Verse 12. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor you will surround him as with a shield. And notice how it says that God will bless the righteous. He will bless the righteous. Um, don't think for a second that God doesn't appreciate it when you do what is right. I know that you can't save yourself by trying to be righteous. It just doesn't work that way. Salvation is a gift through God from Jesus Christ by receiving him. That's salvation. It's a gift. But, but God does appreciate righteousness in the life of a Christian, and he will bless it. He promises to bless it with an eternal reward, if not in this life. In addition to salvation, he'll pile rewards on you for doing what is right in his eyes. He appreciates that. Let's go into Psalm 6. O oh Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger, nor chasten me in your hot displeasure. I can't think of anything worse than having God be angry at me and giving me some kind of a whooping in his hot displeasure, in anger. That would be scary. But I'm so glad that he doesn't because that's not how God operates. I remember one time my pa was so angry at me when I was little because he thought that I broke a window and I broke a lot of windows in my life. But I, did, I just happened to not break this one uh, by a fluke. My pa came home and all he did was look at me and he said, and don't tell me you didn't do it. I didn't have a chance. He chased me. He chased me around the backyard. He never did catch me. And he was in track when he was younger. He had fire in his eyes. He would have caught me. I would have been a dead kid. I swear. I took off running. I don't know how long I ran, but I ran. And I ran in circles and he never caught me. So that's what I think of. And I think that's not how God operates. If you're a Christian, you're a child of God, you're in his family. The Bible says you're adopted into his family by your faith in Jesus Christ. 
And when he has to chasten you as a Christian, as his child, it's never done in his hot displeasure. It's never done in anger. It's never done that way. It's done because he loves you. I remember when Aaron was little. I had to discipline him a few times. Not much, honestly. Not much at all. But I remember the few times that I had to. I hated it. I hated it. I didn't want to do it. I tried to avoid it. But I never, when I had to do it, I never did it in hot displeasure or in anger. And to prove to Aaron that it wasn't about that, I would always pick him up and hug him and tell him I loved him after I got done doing it. Because I didn't want him to think that I hated him and that's what I was doing. And he understood that, I think, after a while. So that's how God is, you know, and that's how he handles his children. So thank goodness that he doesn't do that to us. Now, the unsaved who reject Christ, that's a different story entirely. Because on Judgment Day, he's going to be angry at them. And he's going to be furious at them. And he will judge them in his hot displeasure. Not only because of their sin, but because they've rejected the mercy that he paid for on the cross. And then, then, then his justice is going to take over. So, i got to move on. Verse 2. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are troubled. David was in tough shape physically. And evidently it was due, at least in part, to some sort of discipline because of things that he did wrong. Believe me, he did plenty of things that were wrong. Um, but he knew that God's discipline was always done in love and never in hatred. And he wasn't upset with the Lord because he was going through hard times. He wasn't upset. He knew he had it coming at least in some cases, but he still prayed to God for mercy because he knew that although God is just and he loves us, he's also compassionate and merciful toward those who confess their sins and change their way. So he's praying for mercy. Then he says in verse 3, My soul also is greatly troubled, but you, O Lord, how long? There's a problem. In the previous verse, he talks about his problems being in his body. That's one thing. That's bad enough. But in verse 3, he talks about how his soul, his soul is greatly troubled. It's bad enough to be suffering in your body. But a strong soul, a strong spirit can help you rise above physical problems. It can sustain you. But if a person's soul is in trouble, then you're looking at despair. Then you're looking at some real problems. And people do a lot of hurtful things and harmful things when they're feeling despair. So it's so important when a person begins to reach that point that they encourage themselves in the Lord that by drawing closer to Him and let Him strengthen their soul and their spirit so that they can rise above whatever physical problems or whatever kind of problems are going on in their life until those problems are gone. I mean, I've, I've been there, you know. I remember one time, and I probably shared this, but I remember one time when I was in North Carolina, I was beyond despair. And I don't even know why. I can't even tell you why. But I was beyond despair. I thought I was going to just be gone. I was so just in such despair. Hot, hot day. I remember I, 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 I determined... I'm not going to live like this. I am not going to live like this. I said, God, I'm not going to live like this. I'm going to start walking, and I'm going to start praying, and I'm going to start thanking you, because the Bible says give thanks for all things. I'm going to start thanking you for everything, everything, until I either get the victory over this thing, either you encourage me in my spirit, or I die, one or the other. I don't care. I really didn't care, honestly. So I started walking. And I started thanking God for everything that I could possibly think to thank Him of. After three hours, I'm now giving thanks for the cracks that I see in the parking lot. I mean, it was incredible. Anything that came into my mind, I thank God for it. Three hours it took me. And I never saw, I never felt any change in my despair. Three hours. But after like three hours, I started to just sense just a little, just a little crack, just a little ray of light. And that encouraged me. So I went for another hour. 
And by the time I was done, I was feeling great, no more despair, and that's exactly what I'm talking about right here. That's what God can do for you. He can encourage your spirit, He can encourage your soul, He can lift you up, but it only happens when you seek Him like that, through prayer, praise, worship, <coughs> thanksgiving, whatever it takes. Verse 4, Return, O Lord, deliver me, O save me for your mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave who will give you thanks? Stop there for a second. Look at David's motive here in verse 5. He's asking for deliverance, right? He's asking that his life would be made better. Because he figures he's in such tough shape that he's, he's on the edge of death. But then he says in verse 5, For in death there's no remembrance of you. In the grave who will give you thanks? So he's saying, God, deliver me from this mess I'm in. I'm about to die. Deliver me because... You know, I can't praise you if you're dead, if I'm dead. At least not on earth. I can't work for you and do anything for you on earth if I'm dead. So even in David's prayer of desperation, he still has God, God and God's honor at the center of his prayer. He's saying, God, do it for you. Do it for you. I'm sure David wanted to feel better. And I'm sure he didn't want to die. I'm sure all that's true, which is fine motive. But his supreme motive was God. God, if I die, I can't praise you on earth. And I can't work for you. I can't do good things for you here on earth. So save me for that reason. That's the way it's supposed to be in our motives. This is, uh, this is a theocentric universe. It is a Christocentric creation. In other words, unlike what some people think, that the world revolves around them, it does not. The world revolves around God. The world revolves around Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus made everything. He created all things for His pleasure. All things exist for His pleasure. It's a theocentric universe. So everything should be done primarily for the glory of God to make Jesus happy. It's okay to have other motives, like to well, name them. You know, there's a lot of good motives. But the primary motive undergirding every motive should be to honor Christ. Do it for His honor. Verse 5, verse 6. He says, I'm weary with my groaning. All night I make my bed swim. I drench my couch with my tears. He spent many nights laying in bed crying. And believe me, David was not a crybaby. He was tough as nails. He took on Goliath. But I'll tell you something. When sometimes things can weigh so heavily on a person's mind that that's what they do. And that's what he did. And God saw it. And he's appealing to God on the basis of that. Verse 7. My eye wastes away because of grief. I grow old because of all my enemies. He couldn't cry anymore. He, he couldn't be any more sad than what he was. And he's just pouring out his heart to God. And don't miss that. That's what he did, okay? That's what he did when he was feeling that way. And I wanted to point that out because look at verse 8. Look at the next verse. He turns the corner. Up until this time, it's, God, I'm in trouble. God, my soul is shot. My body is shot. I'm crying my eyes out. I feel terrible. I'm on the verge of death. He was, he was in darkness, about as dark as it could possibly be. And then all of a sudden in verse 8, Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity, for the Lord has heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all my enemies be ashamed and greatly troubled. Let them turn back and be ashamed suddenly. Look at the change that occurred in David right there. All, it went from total despair to all of a sudden he turns the corner, sort of like what happened to me in North Carolina, he turns the corner and he says, you guys who have given me a hard time, you better get away from me because God has heard my prayer. And he's about to act. How did he know that? How did David know that? How did that change? Because David prayed and prayed and prayed until he prayed through. And he touched the heart of God and he knew he touched the heart of God. He knew it. And when he knew that deep down in his soul, then everything changed. Then he knew that God heard his prayer he knew that God was going to answer because God is righteous and he was completely assured of it and he went from despair to confidence and boldness and peace and joy. And that's what prayer does. 
That's why it drives me crazy when I see Christians turning to anything and everything that the world offers to get over sadness and depression and that kind of stuff when God has given us the only thing that we really need and that's a relationship with Him and seeking Him in prayer. And that's, a, that's hard work. You've got to be determined. But boy, you see it right here. Psalm 7. O Lord my God, in You I put my trust. Save me from all those who persecute me and deliver me. So David's putting his trust in God. And you say, well, that's nice. What in the world does that mean? How can I put my trust in God? I will tell you how you do that, okay? Trusting in God means you have to be convinced of the fact that God is good, which he is, that there's no bad in him, that he's always right, never wrong, he's always good, and he always wants what's best, and that he will bring about what's best for you as a Christian because he loves you in Christ. It is trusting in God is saying, God, I know that you are good. I know you want what's best for me. I will rest in that. Whether I like how things turn out or not, I'm going to trust you that you're smarter than me. And if it's not exactly the way I want it to be, I'm going to trust that you, that, that you allowed it for some reason and you're going to bring about good in the long term. If not physical good, for sure spiritual good, my spiritual good. That's what it means to trust in God. And that's the only way to have sanity, really, is to put your trust in Him. Verse 2, Lest they tear me like a lion, rending me in pieces while there is none to deliver. In other words, Lord, if my enemies catch me, I'm done for. So he's saying, bad people aren't going to show me any mercy. That's a fact. He knows people. He knows what they're like. You know, it always amazes me. Some people think that God is harsh because he has standards, because he has rules of right and wrong. But the fact is, God is much more merciful than people, than many people. If not, well, I shouldn't say many, all people. God's mercy is infinite. Verse 3. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there is iniquity in my hands, if I repaid evil to him who was at peace with me, or have plundered my enemy without cause, let the enemy pursue me and overtake me. Yes, let him trample my life to the earth and lay my honor in the dust. Boy, you you got to know you're right with God to pray this prayer. Lord, if I have done these bad things that these people accuse me of doing, then by all means, kill me. Just judge me, wipe me out. That takes boldness. That takes confidence before God to pray that. And that's one of the beautiful things about living for Jesus and confessing the moment that you fail is because you can have that confidence before God. And, uh, and you can say, well, Lord, you know, man, if I got this coming, then give it to me. But deep down inside, you know you don't have that coming because you're walking with Him, see? And you know that God is on your side. Verse 6. Arise, O Lord, in your anger, lift yourself up because of the rage of my enemies. Rise up for me to the judgment you have commanded. In other words, he's saying, Lord, please wake up because this whole situation is wrong. I'm in all this trouble. It's not my fault. All this bad stuff keeps happening to me. is not right. So he's saying, God, how about putting a stop to it? David, you know what I like about this? It's obvious that David didn't like his situation, right? That it was not good. But notice what he's doing. He didn't like his situation, but he didn't become bitter. He didn't quit on God. That's obvious because of what he's doing. His life was not pleasant. He was being treated unfairly, but he didn't stop praying. He's just praying to God, asking for God's help. It was hard. It was hard, but he still had faith in God. Our faith is tested. When life doesn't seem to be fair and God doesn't seem to be doing anything to change it, at least right now, that's when our faith is tested. Anybody can, anybody can talk big about their relationship with God. Anybody, anybody can talk about God and, and how you know, they know God and, and they care about God when times are good. Oh yeah, that's easy. But how about when things aren't going good and you're praying like crazy and for some unknown reason, it's not changing. 
That's when your faith in God is tested. Anybody can do it the other way. But God will change it. He will change it. He will change it for David. He will change it for us. Things will get better no matter how bad they might be right now. They will get better if we know Christ. It's just that God's timing isn't always ours. And sometimes God's timing doesn't happen until eternity, until the next life. Faithful Christian is going to live for Jesus and live for eternity, even if they're not experiencing the good that they want to experience in this life. Seven. So the congregation of the peoples shall surround you. For their sakes, therefore, return on high. In other words, God, he's saying, he's saying sit up on your throne, God, and flex your eternal muscle and take care of business. Take care of the bad people because you've got a lot of people out here who want to see you do the right thing and want to see bad people put in their place. And again, it's going to happen. Verse 8, The Lord shall judge the peoples. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity within me. Verse 8, or verse 9, O oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just. For the righteous God tests the hearts and the minds. God tests the hearts and the minds. So just a reminder that God not only looks at and examines what a person says and does, but he also looks at the motive behind what a person says and does too. He knows what's in our heart. So sometimes we may do things that are bad, but God knows our heart. He, doesn't, he knows that we didn't mean to do bad, okay? And he takes that into consideration. Likewise, sometimes people do good outwardly, but their motives are selfish, and God knows that too. So they're good things, they're good words, sweet sounding words, you know, good deeds with bad motives are actually in the eyes of God, bad things. He's not buying it. He's a righteous judge. He knows what's going on. Verse 10, my defense is of God who saves the upright in heart. God saves the upright in heart. The upright in heart refers to people who have holy desires, okay? You are upright in heart if deep down inside you want to do what is right in the eyes of God. Everybody sins. Christians sin. People who love Jesus sin. Everybody sins. But a real Christian is set apart from the rest of the world because they have holy desires. They are upright in heart. Not always upright in action, but upright in heart. A genuine Christian is someone who wants to know what is right, so they read the Bible, and they want to do what is right more than anything else, and so that's why they confess when they fail and they get back on track. That's what it means to be upright in heart. Those are the people that God saves, according to this verse. I wanted to get through this, this song, but I'm restrained by that 30-minute uh, clock for television, so I'm going to have to stop right here. And Lord, we thank you for your word. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Let the beauty of the Lord our God rest upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. In Jesus' name, amen.